afternoon, everyone. I'm Afrin John, and welcome to the exclusive interview series by South Asia Research Institute for Minorities. Today, we have a very well-known and recognized guest for an interview, and I'm really excited to talk with her, Ambika Satkananan. She is indeed a well-known figure. Well, she works as a human rights advocate, doing research advocating for rights and supporting communities in obtaining remedies for breaches of their rights. She is an Open Society Fellow and a former commissioner of the Sri Lankan Human Rights Commission, where she oversaw the country's first ever nationwide prison research. In Sri Lanka, she worked as a legal consultant for the UN Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. She is a member of the Colony Foundation Trial Watch Project, Expert Panel, and the Global Initiative Networks of Experts Against Transitional Organization Crime. She is also a vice chairperson of Urgent Action Fund, the Asian and Pacific Region uh, Feminist Grand Marketing Organization. She received her Master's of Law Human Rights from the University of Nottingham, where she was a trained scholar. She and her bachelor's degree LLBBA from the Monans University in Australia. Well, very warmly welcome, Ambika, and how are you doing today? Thank you. I'm good. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to be part of the series. Thank you so much. I think let's begin today's interview with the name of God. My first question is, uh, please discuss with the story behind what you do and the objectives that you want to attain. Well, uh, the story behind what I do, I suppose it's also uh, based on uh, or it came from my personal experiences and identity as a Tamil in Sri Lanka, who's also experienced discrimination, violence, uh, and I think the need to work for human rights and to work on human rights and try to address some of the issues that we face in Sri Lanka uh, was motivated by my personal experience and my identity. So since then, as you mentioned, I worked in different spheres. I worked in civil society. I worked within the UN system. Then also within the state structure as a member of the Human Rights Commission. And in all of them, I found there were different, there were obstacles that we face in trying to protect and promote human rights, but there are also different strategies that we can use or benefits of being part of these different uh, ecosystems, shall we say. So that I would say is the story of why I do what I do. Okay, that's great. And uh, I'm really inspired by your work. When, uh, my next question is, you work as a fellow with Open Foundation and doing research. What research you are doing as a fellow? Uh, please share uh, something about your research. Oh, well, I am a fellow of the Open Society Foundation. Uh, and the research that I'm doing is looking at different uh, reform processes, because I think <coughs> even in Sri Lanka and also in many parts of South Asia, and even globally, uh, a lot of uh, uh, state reform processes are often initiated. And this is also done at the behest of international donors or the UN who also support these processes. So it can be like a constitutional reform process or it can entail establishing new organizations like let's say uh, a country that doesn't have human rights commission, maybe they established that. It can be reforming laws, but many of these uh, reform processes we have found have not been successful. And I am trying to identify why these reform processes are not successful and what are the elements that uh, particularly the international community or donors or the UN, when they support such processes, what are the factors that they did not take into account, which led to the failures of these processes. So although my research, is, research focuses only on Sri Lanka, I think generally, it will be useful in other contexts as well. A uh, really tremendous work you are doing and I really appreciate your work. My next question is, you work with Human Rights Commission. Please tell us what you learned from it. Why uh, HRC is important to a country, how HRC should function and please tell us most proud of your time as a commissioner. But I think um, Human Rights Commission is very important uh, for many reasons. One, is um, 
many people, it's a way of monitoring whether the government or the, the state, but the government of the day, whether they are adhering uh, to uh, uh, constitutional protections or other protections, what they are doing to protect and promote human rights, whether their actions are in line with international human rights standards. Um, that, so that is one of the roles usually. The other one is to enable citizens whose rights have been violated to make complaints because many people don't know about their rights or they do not have the financial means to uh, go to a court of law to seek some sort of remedy. So the Human Rights Commission is supposed to provide a free and easier remedy for human rights violations. Many human rights commissions are also mandated to advise the government on various issues related to human rights, like law reform, how to ensure that the local laws are in line with international human rights standards. Usually, if, if you look globally, these are the general um, duties of a human rights commission. But it is extremely important that a human rights commission is independent because in many countries, they are not independent. There are internationally, there are standards called the Paris principles and all human rights commissions need to adhere to these Paris principles. The main thing is independence of appointment. So for instance, if in a country, only, only the president has the sole power to appoint members to the commission, then it means that the commission is not independent because just one person has the power to appoint and he or she can appoint whoever they want. So it is, it is imperative that a human rights commission is independent and is able to function independently. Sometimes certain governments uh, curtail the activities of human rights commission through funding, right? Because the government has to fund and if you cut funding off, well, then the human rights commission can't be as effective. Uh, so I would say those are the, some of the challenges that human rights commissions would also encounter in their countries and uh, government backlash, government trying to control the commission, which makes the commission also then, uh, you know, not be independent. What are the, what is the achievement that I'm most proud of? Well, one of the things that I'm extremely proud of is, of course, the National Study of Prisons. For the first time in the country, uh, we did a study of prisons in Sri Lanka. I, let, I conceptualized and led that study and that resulted in a, in a very detailed report, 863 page report, which I think is very useful, not just for Sri Lanka, but also globally, because um, it validates many of the things that researchers and advocates all over the world have been saying, for instance, in relation to the death penalty, how that affects uh, people who are marginalized and poor. So once again, this is an advocacy tool that people not only in Sri Lanka, but also all over the world can use. Uh, thank you, Ambika. I really admire your uh, work you did and I really admire your work you are doing. Moving forward to the next question, you also work for OSCHR. What role does OSCHR plays in protecting and promoting human rights? And how can the UN system be used by victims and activists to seek remedies for human rights violations? Well, the Office of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights is the main agency within the UN system that is tasked or its mandate is to work on human rights. And uh, what it does is it monitors human rights developments globally. It documents them. And of course, the High Commissioner makes them public, you know, through her statements, through her reports. They establish offices in certain countries, in regions that, you know, makes it easier for them to monitor, to report, to document all those things. OHCHR also functions as a secretariat for the UN special procedures. That brings me to the second part of your question is that, uh, the UN has these uh, entities called, uh, it's called um, uh, the UN Special Procedures, which are, uh, you have thematic mandates and you have country mandates. So you have the UN Special Rapporteurs, for instance, on torture, on extrajudicial and summary killings, on the right to health. Then you have the Working Group on Arbitrary Detention. So these uh, entities focus on specific issues, 
they visit countries, they monitor, they document, and they report. They also accept complaints. So if someone, let's say in Sri Lanka, has been arbitrarily detained, they can submit a complaint to the UN Working Group on arbitrary detention. But there isn't much action that the working group can take unless the government is also cooperative because the, the working group will then send a letter to the government about the violation, asking them for information. Uh, then they might actually write back with recommendations on what needs to be done regarding a case. But more than that, they can't do anything else. So if the government... Uh, does not cooperate, then the impact of the work of the special procedures can also be um, limited. Because for instance, they can undertake a country visit, they can issue a very, you know, they can issue a brilliant report with great recommendations. But if the government does not implement the recommendations, then uh, there is nothing that the special procedure can do. So the UN uh, the special procedures as well as the Office of the Human uh, High Commissioner for Human Rights do play a very important role in bringing to light many human rights violations. They develop jurisprudence on human rights, on how the UN treaties need to be interpreted. But in terms of concrete action, the responsibility lies with the governments. And if the governments don't do anything, then of course, uh, the impact of the work of these entities will definitely be diminished. Uh, thank you, Ambika. Thank you so much for sharing your golden thoughts on that. Moving forward to the next question. Uh, I want to ask you, what does it mean to protect human rights and the rights of minorities in today's political scenario uh, when certain political institutions perceive them as a threat to their countries? Uh, yes, you very rightly, as you said, uh, protection of the rights of minorities in, is increasingly becoming a, uh, uh, a very challenging task because we find that in many countries we have majoritarian governments, we have ethno-nationalist governments that engage in ethno-nationalist politics, and they usually use minorities, they, are, you know, uh, they demonize them, they vilify them, they they present the minorities as a, as a threat to the other communities or to the country, and that is how they, they win votes. So then uh, protection of minorities becomes a challenge. And I think in South Asia, it definitely is a challenge because whichever country you look at, the minorities in all, these, all our South Asian countries are under threat. And the government, which is mandated to protect and promote the rights of these minorities, because they're also citizens, well, most of them, um, are the ones that are uh, violating the rights of these minorities. So therefore, it is a huge challenge. And we have civil society organizations in all these countries that are challenging state action through legal means, through advocacy. People are appealing to the UN systems. So people are trying to use multiple ways to... Um, to challenge this kind of majoritarian ethno-nationalist politics of the governments, which are adversely impacting on the rights of minorities. Uh, well, no doubt, Ambika, you did, uh, you did amazing work as the Commissioner of Human Rights Commission. Well, I want to ask that, uh, what have been the most difficult obstacles you have faced as a Commissioner of the Sri Lankan Human Rights Commissioner? Uh, well, I would say because the Commission um, was uh, not independent for many years before we were appointed uh, because uh, before 2015, the president could make appointments directly. So the commission actually was not independent. The commission did not uh, in work closely with civil society. Uh, it was downgraded from A to B status by the Global Alliance on National Human Rights Institutions. Uh, but of course, with the constitutional change in 2015, it was made independent again. So we were appointed after that. Uh, so I think we found that the lack of independence for more than 10 years had really um, uh, disempowered the commission. And uh, we found that the commission, uh, uh, it had eroded the independence and also the perception of the staff as to how they should function. 
we found that there weren't adequate staff members, that the staff members didn't have enough capacity. And therefore it was very challenging to motivate them and to ensure that they were, you know, um, they function in, an, in a way that was uh, impactful. Uh, I would say that was one of the most challenging things because you have all these aspirations, but it becomes quite difficult because of the structure. So for instance, even the other government structures didn't look at us in a friendly way. They did not cooperate with us. When we issued recommendations, many of the state uh, you know, institutions did not implement those recommendations. So I think the effectiveness of the Human Rights Commission also depends on the government, on the state institutions as to whether they implement our recommendations. And even the government, we found many of the recommendations were not implemented. So I think that is one of the, the challenges, the, the most critical challenges that we face. Uh, well, Ambika, I truly valued your work uh, you did. And uh, moving forward to the next question, what grassroots activist, activists have been established to assist an individual or overcome their fear of taking actions in the face of uh, injustice? Well, I think the, the people the, at the grassroots, at the community level, they do a lot of important work because they are the ones who are documenting violations and they are the ones who are also making the affected communities aware of the rights they have. And they also assist these communities to access remedies. So whether it is to make a complaint in, uh, you know, to find a legal mechanism or to the Human Rights Commission or to take it to the UN system. So I think the, the activists on the ground are, the, are very, very important if we want to protect the rights of the vulnerable and marginalized and especially challenge the increasing kind of majoritarian ethno-nationalist politics that we see in this region. Uh, well, Ambika, no doubt that uh, you are having a charismatic personality. Well, uh, my next question is, um, what are your basic ideas on how governments uh, might effectively encourage religious and uh, belief freedom across the world, especially in South Asia? <laughs> well, I think many of our constitutions do already have enshrined these rights and many of the governments of the region have ratified many of the international conventions. The problem here is that they do not implement it. Sometimes their actions are in their contrary to their own constitutions, and most often they're contrary to the international obligations they have as, as signatories to these international human rights conventions. So I think the first step would be for the countries to respect their own constitutions, to respect the rule of law, and to respect their international obligations, which of course they don't want to do because they find it more convenient to engage in majoritarian ethno-nationalist politics, which is they feel is, is easier to uh, win votes. Uh, well, what do you believe should be done in the near future to address more serious problem that South Asian minorities are facing? Well, I think, as I said, it always, always comes back to the government in the sense that, you know, it is, it is as I, and it goes back to my previous answer about what the governments need to do. Of course, at the South Asian level, I think we need to also um, have or establish more links between civil societies in, in our different countries, because many of the problems we face are quite similar and collective advocacy helps. And also we can learn from each other. In certain countries, they might have success using some strategies to deal with a particular issue. So I think for the sake of learning uh, and uh, getting new ideas and for solidarity and to have a collective voice on critical issues in the region, it is important for increasing civil society collaboration within the region between the countries. Uh, well, no doubt, Ambika, you did a tremendous work uh, as a commissioner of the Human Rights Commission. You serve as a commission of the Sri Lankan Human Rights Commissioner from 2015 to 2020, where you conducted the country's first ever nationwide prison research. What was the more important of the significance of promoted you, uh, you to conduct the study on that topic? I think it's because it's also an issue that is often ignored. And uh, uh, people in prison are 
not viewed as uh, people even. Forget about being viewed as citizens, they're not even viewed as people and there's a lot of prejudice. And in South Asia, we also, uh, and particularly in, in Sri Lanka, what we see is we have a very punitive approach to uh, crime. We think that we need to pass laws and we just need to punish and then we will solve social problems. Uh, so the study that we did was to find out what is wrong with the entire penal system. And what we found is what is wrong with the penal system is very much related to the criminal justice system. And there is a lot of inequality and discrimination in the way the criminal justice system works. So all of it, we really need to reimagine it because the way it currently works, it's not objective, it is not neutral. And those who are most vulnerable, marginalized, the poor are the ones who end up in prison. And um, so we don't actually address the, the social systemic structural inequalities. We just come up with new laws and new punishment, which we think will solve the problem, but it actually doesn't. So we need to reimagine how we view law and order, how we view crime. And we need to, um, yeah, it's basically reimagining uh, um, uh, crime versus harm. Now, for instance, certain things are crimes, but they don't cause harm. But certain things that cause harm are not made crimes. So the question is, who is making the law? Who benefits from the law? And who, who is uh, discriminated by the law? So I think these are things that came out of the prison study is that we really need to relook at how our criminal justice systems work. And we need to think about crime and punishment differently. Oh, well, thank you, Ambika, for your uh, precious thoughts. Uh, moving forward to the next question. How do you feel about uh, the current state of religious freedom in South Asia? What are some of the most prevalent uh, roadblocks in uh, arguments uh, uh, over uh, free speech and religious and culture concerns? Uh, what can countries in South Asia do to lessen the chance of conflict? Well, I think uh, religious freedom is in a really bad state in South Asia because whichever country you look at, the religious, you know, the minority groups, whether it's Sri Lanka, whether it's India, whether it's Maldives, whether it's Pakistan, you do have in most of the countries, the, the, the religious freedom, particularly of the minority community is under attack. And that is because, as I said before, uh, leaders are practicing majoritarian ethno-nationalist politics uh, and uh, to win votes, to come into power. We saw that even in Sri Lanka. So for in Sri Lanka, uh, the Tamils, there was an ethnic conflict because of discrimination against the Tamils. We had a, a, a war for 30 years. And we have also seen, particularly in the past kind of more than 10 years, increasing discrimination and violence against the Muslims as well. We saw um, the, the forced uh, cremation of Muslims who died of COVID. And after only a lot of advocacy and a lot of pressure, both national and internationally, they agreed to let the Muslims bury people who died of COVID, but still in only in one place in the Eastern province. So for a Muslim who dies of COVID in Colombo, they have to take the person all the way from Colombo to the Eastern province, which causes a lot of trauma, a lot of problems and a lot of cost. Plus the burial place in, in, in the Eastern province is now full. And, but still the WHO has said that there is absolutely no problems uh, with burial. And may, most of the countries in the world, I think pretty much all of them actually do allow people to bury. So therefore you can see that um, there is discrimination against minorities and also the rights of minorities to be able to practice their religion is very much curtailed. And in this, the government does not take action, they ignore what goes on, or sometimes and most often they are the ones who are enabling it. It comes from the government, the discrimination comes from the government, particularly hate speech. And now but in social media, Facebook, Twitter, particularly Facebook, there is a lot of incitement of hatred against minorities. Uh, and this is also uh, 
enabled by the governments as well, because you find even government ministers and you know people affiliated with the government engaging in such hate speech. So there seems to be a lot of freedom of speech where hate speech is concerned, but for religious minorities, there isn't freedom of speech or to freedom to practice their religion. Uh, well, Amika, truly, I appreciate your word. Uh, my next question is, uh, how would you classify which nation activists are more unsecure, unprotected, or unsafe because of the prevalent use of violence against human rights and minority rights activists in the South Asia region? Uh, what steps should they take to protect minority rights advocates? Yeah, you're very right, because human rights advocates uh, in South Asia are very much under threat. We have seen many people who uh, you know, spoke up against uh, bigotry, hatred, and particularly against governments, challenging government incitement of hatred. We have seen them being murdered. We have seen many of them being uh, you know, arrested and imprisoned. Uh, so I think at this time, clearly, of course, as I've said, the governments really do need to um, uh, abide by the rule of law, abide by the constitution, abide by their international obligations, but we also do need to see the courts. The courts are very important in giving remedies. So the courts have to be independent. The courts have to protect um, the constitution and they also need to provide protections for uh, civil rights activists, for human rights activists. The UN also has an important role to play because if you find that human rights activists or human rights defenders are being persecuted, unprosecuted, the UN needs to be very vocal, not just the High Commissioner for Human Rights, the UN agencies in that particular country too, as well as special procedures. They need to highlight it. They need to put pressure on the governments. Uh, so those are some of the uh, things that can and should be done. Uh, well, Ambika, when we talk about South Asia region, persecution has a big role in South Asia. Thanks to social media, uh, please provide some approaches and ideas for dealing with the issues of religious freedom and the spread of hate speech on social media. I mean, as I said, this uh, spread of uh, hate speech on social media is a problem. And we also find that in you know, companies like Facebook, uh, enable it, and they're not taking adequate protection to stop it. Uh, because we found, uh, now yesterday, there was a story I saw in the Washington, uh, I think it was the Washington Post, uh, about how Facebook uh, allows certain prominent people to post anything, and they get a free ride. So they're not subject to the same restrictions as other people. So if you or I posted hate speech, it would be taken down immediately. But if you are a prominent person or a VIP, then it appears you're not subject to the same rules, which means that politicians, for instance, are able to spew hate speech and incite their followers. They, we know that in certain countries, they have all IT cells, right? People recruited just to do this. And, um, then it becomes very challenging for the human rights activists. So one of the ways is, of course, putting pressure on companies like Facebook to take action. And uh, that is why many people are even calling for you know, uh, certain regulations, certain standards to be followed um, uh, in terms of these, these countries. But also, as I said, uh, when we look at social media, we forget that even mainstream media spews a lot of hate. Now, in a country like India, you find TV channels, right, have been doing a lot of spewing of hate against Muslims, not just social media, mainstream media. In Sri Lanka, too, we found that uh, um, in the last uh, you know, few couple of years, uh, mainstream media TV channels have been very instrumental in spewing hate against Muslims. Um, so uh, there is that problem as well, but also at the same time, I am really not for excessive regulation of the media because you cannot trust governments to regulate freedom of speech. They will always want to curtail it and freedom of speech and freedom of the media is extremely important. So it's also about creating a culture. I mean, public pressure is very important. If there is public backlash, 
then of course we have seen some in Sri Lanka, we have seen some of the media seem to change their strategy. So public uh, pressure is very important as well as putting pressure on these companies like so, you know, Facebook to uh, bring in, uh, to regulate you know, themselves uh, and even to put measure on the media to, to regulate themselves and to have standards to abide by media ethics. Uh, these are some of the things I think that um, uh, could be done. Well, thank you, Ambika. And uh, hopefully uh, the situation of COVID in Sri Lanka is better. And uh, now we all are fronting from uh, the Delta virus. Do you believe that COVID-19 has the potential uh, to worsen the person the already taught situation from minorities in South Asia. Uh, give the use of diverse a hat critic and a rush by certain governments in the area of crucial civil liberties. Uh, yes, I mean, in the sense what COVID has done is COVID has illustrated to us or it's highlighted the existing uh, social, socioeconomic inequalities, you know, the structural systemic inequalities. What governments have done is that they have used COVID as an excuse to crack down on freedom of speech, freedom of religion, and on minorities, and even on human rights defenders. They have used COVID health regulations to ban uh, protests or demonstrations. Um, therefore, they have, and uh, in Sri Lanka we saw that uh, when uh, they, I think it was during the second wave, uh, there were people in the media, uh, even public officials, who blamed the Muslims and saying that the Muslims, because of them, that the COVID infections were increasing. So COVID has been used by governments, not only to restrict human rights and civil, civil liberties, but also to uh, spew hate against minorities. Um, so that, that is a, a negative development that we have seen because of COVID. Uh, well, thank you, Ambika. Moving forward to the next question. The Constitution of uh, South Asia defines that countries to be circular and protects freedom of religious and belief. Christian, Muslim and Dalits, on the other hand, believes uh, that they are being persecuted and discriminated against uh, and that their situation has become worse in the recent areas, uh, in recent years. Uh, how do you feel about this? Well, I think not all the constitutions in South Asia and South Asian countries are secular, right? So I would say, um, you know, the Indian constitution is secular, but the Sri Lankan constitution is not exactly secular. The Pakistani constitution can't be called, you know, secular. So I think uh, uh, we are not really, our constitutions are not secular. And the idea of secularism is not, has not been internalized in many of our countries. Although, now in Sri Lanka, we can say it's a multi-ethnic country and a multi-religious country. And there's also been, um, um, what shall we say, um, you know, um, uh, coexistence to, in, in some uh, examples, you know, some instances where a multicultural country, but still we do have, uh, you know, Sinhala Buddhist nationalism, which is what has driven most government policies and which is what has resulted in the ethnic conflict and also in discrimination. This we find in many of the South Asian countries. You no, know, it's different thing. You can take Sinhala Buddhist nationalism, but other countries, it's been different ideologies. Um, um, so I think uh, it is not really secular. What we must do is try to move to secular constitutions, but just because you have a secular constitution, look at India, it does not mean that minority rights will be protected because if the government of the day engages in majoritarian ethno-nationalist politics and is determined to make one particular community like the Muslims, you know, demonize them and target them, then I think what we have seen is even the constitution can't always provide protection. Uh, well, Ambika, uh... Given the rise in discrimination and the persecution of minorities in recent years, it is critical to mentor and urge governments to adopt human rights legislation. Do you think a regional platform would be helpful in containing or eliminating, uh, eliminating this threat? Well, I think, um, as I said before, regional platform is important and more uh, collaborations at the regional level is important to put pressure on the governments, right? Collectively, 
to protect human rights. That is extremely important. And also to put pressures on our own government. So for instance, uh, because there are intergovernmental relationships. So in relation to certain issues, we can put pressure on our government as to how they deal with another government in relation to a certain issue. So in Sri Lanka, where the ethnic conflict is concerned, the Tamil Nadu uh, puts pressure on the central government and tries to influence central government policies in relation to Sri Lanka. So, and yeah, but I think a collective platform in relation to human rights regionally is something that is very important, but something that is quite still weak to a great extent and something we must work on. Uh, well, Ambika, if I'm not wrong, uh, your research and advocacy have uh, focused on transitional uh, justice, cordial uh, violence, uh, panel reforms, uh, gender Tamil, nationalism and marginalization. Uh, which marginalized communities do you work with? Well, I would say uh, <laughs> with, of course, you know, uh, with Tamils, with Muslims, with uh, LGBTIQ persons, with uh, persons with disabilities and also uh, communities that are in the plantations in Sri Lanka because they were brought from India and they have suffered historical marginalization and discrimination. So I would say those are the main communities with whom I work. Uh, well, Sarah is always looking for the professionals to speak at our events. An international conference of featuring speakers for the United States, Canada, Bangladesh, the Maldives, and India was held in July 2019. If the worldwide pandemic situation stabilized, would you want to join us in Pakistan for our next gathering? Sure, sure. I'd be happy to. Uh, well, thank you. Last but not the least, my question is, finally, in commemoration of United Nations International Peace Day, what message do you have for minorities in South Asia? Well, I think I don't have messages for minorities because I think the message has to be for the governments of South Asia and to say that, uh, you know, minorities are also citizens and citizens have equal rights. And you cannot have peace in the country or peace in the region without ensuring human rights and particularly the rights of minorities. Individual communicative freedom is protected by human rights, which are moral norms, despite the fact that such moral principles are separated from the legal politicization and specification of rights. There is a necessary and not merely depending link between human rights as moral principles and their legal forms on the dedication to democratic system of governments. A free civil society and a public realm can protect the unity and variety of human rights. Well, thank you so much, Ambika, for, your, for giving your precious and valuable time to us. Uh, thanks for sharing your delighted and uh, tremendous thoughts with us. Truly, truly appreciated. Now, Afrin John is signing off for today's interview. Remember me in your prayers. Take care. Goodbye. God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you.